Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Ruz Tusi here at Ortho Virginia. I'm going to discuss with you a little bit about spinal stenosis. I've been here at Ortho Virginia for approximately four weeks. I've been doing pain management for over seven years now. Uh, and then if we can see that first slide. So spinal stenosis. Stenosis, I'm going to clarify now, is just a big fancy word for narrowing slide. There's multiple causes of low back pain and spinal stenosis is just one of them. If you've had a long history of low back pain, you've probably heard some of these terms such as degenerative disc disease, lumbar radiculopathy, lumbar facet pain, SI joint pain or sacroiliac joint pain. Muscles in and of themselves can cause low back pain. And then finally, lumbar spinal stenosis. All of these could have similar symptoms, which makes my job as a spine physician more challenging. Next slide, please. Degenerative disc disease is essentially what it means. It's degeneration of those little cushions in your back that provide shock absorption when we lift, push, pull. Uh, as these degenerate, we can get worsening arthritis. We can get narrowing of the spine or stenosis. Uh, and the discs themselves can cause pain, which we call discogenic pain. Next slide, please. Facet mediated pain. These are the little joints in your back where your vertebrae connect with each other. They can cause ache and pain, stiffness. A lot of people tell me when they get up in the morning, they have a hard time getting up and moving, but once they do, they're doing okay until they sit too long, stand too long, or lay down too long. Uh, most of the time, facet pain just stays in the back, but it can also ache into your buttocks and your legs as well. Next slide. Muscle pain, so everyone can get a little bit of muscular pain. Uh, those other conditions we've discussed can also irritate the muscles and cause spasms. Uh, and also when we perform activities that we're not usually used to performing, we put ourselves at risk of straining or spraining a muscle. Next slide. Sacroiliac joint pain. These symptoms also cause low back pain. A lot of times I'll hear my back and my hip hurts. Uh, starts in the much lower part of your back. It can ache all the way around into your hips. A lot of patients tell me if I'm twisting, sweeping, vacuuming, or going up and down stairs, my back will start hurting. This can also have similar symptoms to spinal stenosis or facet pain or discogenic pain. Next slide. And finally, our topic of interest is lumbar spinal stenosis, which impacts millions of people, mostly people over the age of 60. About 20% of people over the age of 60 will have some type of spinal stenosis and over two and a half million people are currently in treatment. By stenosis, we're talking about that narrowing down the center. So you can see there's a normal one there. And those little dots on the inside are those are the little nerves that are going through your central canal and they depart through the side and go to your hips and your legs and your back. And you can see the other one, which is unhealthy. We have that thickened ligament there, which is contributing to the narrowing of the spine, as well as those degenerative joints in the back, causing arthritis and get enlarged. And then we have that disc bulge that's protruding in, also causing stenosis. Next slide. So what symptoms do lumbar spinal stenosis patients have? Generally, we know they have very limited quality of life. Uh, they can't stand for too long without hurting, walk for too long without hurting. Uh, generally, at a certain point, they'll tell me they start feeling their back ache, their back ache, their hips starting to get weak, or they'll start getting tinglings in their legs. Uh, Generally, leaning forward is a benefit. We call this the shopping cart sign, as we'll see people uh, pushing a shopping cart around, even though they only have one or two items in the cart, is because they need that cart to get through the store. A lot of people can tell me they know exactly how far they can walk and start looking for chairs in order to be able to sit down. They end up sleeping in recliners or only on their side in the fetal position. And this is just accentuating that flexed or that bent forward position that allows them to sleep and alleviates the narrowing. Next slide, please. And there you have a side view of what that stenosis looks like and the procedure that has been going on, relatively novel procedure called minimally invasive lumbar decompression, uh, which we call mild procedure. This has been 
uh, recently improved and has been gradually growing across the country over the last two to three years. We have two physicians here at OrthoVA, myself included, who perform this procedure. Next, next slide, please. A mild address is the root cause of the lumbar spinal stenosis, which is in the narrowing of the spine. Uh, it's designed to treat the leg pain and your ability to, to stand longer. Uh, we can do this procedure with a small incision uh, going in with a pencil sized tool to clean out that thickened ligament and remove that kink. It's a very short outpatient procedure uh, with a very high safety profile uh, with done with just a little bit of numbing medicine and some light sedation. Next slide. It's an option for a lot of patients, uh, people who have severe stenosis to mild stenosis, people who just won't tolerate a larger back surgery due to other medical conditions. At this time, they're limiting back surgery to people who have who are lighter in weight. So if your BMI is over 40, it's going to be hard to find anyone willing to operate on you. A lot of patients are on blood thinners now, which can also pose a, pose a challenge for larger back surgeries. Uh, we can do this procedure on all the lumbar levels. Unfortunately, it's not approved for the neck or the upper spine. And we can do this in patients, on a select patients who've already had some type of low back surgery. Next slide. It does have long-term benefit and is relatively safe. Next slide. Safety profile is equivalent to an epidural steroid injection. If you've had back treatments or back surgery in the past, then you'll know what these are. Generally, if you people with spinal stenosis, we do try at least the one epidural. Uh, prior to the introduction of the mild procedure, people were getting two, three, up to four epidurals a year. A lot of times, if your condition is mostly just spinal stenosis, uh, the benefit of an epidural can be of relatively short duration. At this time now, if your symptoms are highly consistent with spinal stenosis, we usually do try the one epidural, but if you only get a short duration of relief, uh, then we start discussing mild procedure. Uh, we found that there's really no further benefit of giving more epidurals uh, if the first one doesn't help for very long. Next slide. In terms of complications, it's equivalent to an epidural steroid injection. At two years out, the mild procedure was not found to show any type of spinal instability. And since there's no hardware placed and very little disruption of the spine, there's no spinal fractures or hardware complications at two years. Next slide. In terms of outcomes, which is important, the Cleveland Clinic study at one year showed that people had a 600% improvement at 12 months in their ability to stand longer and were able to walk 1500% farther at 12 months than they did prior to the MR, to, to the mild procedure. Next slide. So this slide is just to kind of show us the way things are now in terms of where mild falls into the treatment regimens. Before we would do injections and if they were of no benefit, then we were either talking about doing some type of implant, such as a spinal cord stimulator or interspinous spacer, or sending you off to have open surgery. Now, if injections are of no benefit, uh, certain patients will be a candidate for the mild procedure prior to having to go to discuss more aggressive types of procedures for their back pain. Next slide. So what are the benefits of this procedure? It's a very short outpatient procedure. I do these mostly with just one single incision. Uh, we go in and can clean out usually one to two levels on both sides. Uh, occasionally we'll do three. At the most, you may have up to four incisions depending on how easily we can access that area. A very low risk profile as we have just discussed. Uh, we're not masking pain, we're actually treating pain by opening up that narrowing. If we do the mild and it doesn't work, uh, it doesn't restrict you from the other treatments we have discussed, such as the spinal cord stimulator or, or a bigger back surgery. And in terms of recovery, most people are up and about within 24 to 48 hours after the procedure. Next slide. So this is just to show you how the procedure looks on a model. 
Uh, we do about a half a centimeter incision and under x-ray guidance, we go in and initially remove just a little bit of bone in order to be able to get our tools inside. Once that bone is removed, we go in and remove that thickened ligament that is contributing to the narrowing of the spine. We can't really do anything about those enlarged joints or those disc bulges, but sometimes all we really need to do is open up that space and pulling back and removing some of that ligament is the purpose of the mild uh, and once it's all done we close up with just a specialized band-aid called the steri strip next slide please so if you come in for your appointment what do we want you to think about before coming in is where do you experience the discomfort how does it change through time uh, how do you get comfortable the sitting give you some relief? Does leaning forward give you some relief or does that worsen your pain? How long can you stand for? How long can you walk for before you start looking for a place to sit? And how much is this really affecting your quality of life? Next slide. It is covered by Medicare, most US military insurances. The commercial coverage can vary, but they're gradually coming on board and covering this procedure. Next slide. We'll definitely need an MRI. Uh, we usually like them within a year, uh, but once you come in, if you had your MRI outside of Ortho, Virginia, then we request you bring the images so we can look at them together. Uh, we'll go through your MRI with you, discuss all what we see and all potential treatment options. If you do have narrowing of the spine, then we'll potentially discuss the mild procedure as well as a treatment option. Next slide. So what about after mild? Uh, like I said, patients are usually up within 24 to 48 hours. We have them get up and walking around within two to three days. Uh, I generally have my patients start physical therapy one week after mild, but not to work on back pain, to work on reconditioning as a lot of my patients haven't been up and walking due to pain for a long time. So the goal at now is to get them up, recondition those legs, have them work on balance. Uh, and then we do post operative appointments at two weeks and four to six weeks. Next slide. So what's the goals of mild to help patients stand longer and walk farther with less pain to improve activity level and improve their quality of life. A lot of my patients who are candidates for this are in retirement. And really the most important thing for me is for them to be able to start doing the things they've been waiting to do for all those years now that they're retired. Next slide. Excellent. Thank you everyone. And we'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much. We have plenty of questions coming in, so please keep leaving them in the comments. So one of our questions that we get is, are there foods that you should eat or avoid if you have lumbar spinal stenosis to help with the condition and does turmeric help? Uh, well, turmeric is an anti-inflammatory. Now you can have spinal stenosis with inflammation. That means that narrowing is so aggressive that it's irritating the nerves and they're inflamed. In those situations, turmeric has shown to have anti-inflammatory properties. At this time, some people are discussing that a low carbohydrate diet may be of some benefit with inflammatory conditions. If you think about inflammation requiring carbohydrates to keep it fueled, to cut some of that fuel would be a benefit. The other thing that will help the most is just a healthy diet and weight loss. As you get heavier, you're going to put more weight on that spine and you're going to compress those nerves even further. Uh, other natural medication red medications could be alpha lipoic acid, which have shown to help with nerve type of pain, as well as palmitine, ethanolamide, or otherwise called PEA, which is also a natural remedy for nerve pain. Thank you. What does MILD stand for? Minimally Invasive Lumbar Decompression. Thank you. Does this have the same benefits as spinal fusion? Uh, well, spinal fusion can be used for a lot of, lot of different causes. Uh, if spinal fusion is used for spinal stenosis, it could have equivalent outcomes. Uh, the data on mild procedure is going about two to three years out now and has shown some sustained relief. Now the aggressiveness here of the procedure is a lot less than mild, allowing it to be done in just an outpatient procedure suite uh, and for people to go home that day. A larger lumbar fusion could treat multiple causes of spinal stenosis, but at the same time will come with a higher risk profile. Thank you. Can this procedure be used for stage two spondy patients? Yeah, so for spondylolisthesis, for those of people who are listening who don't know, is when you have a little bit of slippage of the spine, that means one of your vertebrae are slid forward 
uh, but mild procedure is available for people who have stage two spondylolisthesis or less. We will order bending x-rays to make sure that slippage doesn't go into a stage three in certain positions, but in general, I have done them on several patients with stage two spondylolisthesis. Thank you. So what is the recovery after mild for patients that are very active, like doing strength training and things like that? Is that a different recovery timeline until they can get back to their activities? It's generally on a case by case basis. After I do the mild, I gen I restrict activity to aggressive aggressive activities like that for at least till the follow up appointment, and then at the follow up appointment, we'll discuss uh, getting back to an exercise regimen, especially if it's been one that you did. Uh, we generally recommend that you go back slowly and gradually to those regimens. This is one of the benefits of physical therapy is that after the mild, if we get physical therapy going, we can talk with the physical therapist about what your exercise goals are, and then they can gradually get you working to where you were. Thank you. You said that you would look at doing the mild procedure after an injection if the injection only helped for a short period of time. What time period would that short period of time be? So in terms of the injections, you can generally expose people to steroids about three to four times a year, maybe five times. And then we start worrying about the side effects of the steroid itself. So if with three to four shots a year, you feel like you're maintaining a decent quality of life and it's lasting you that long, then we would just proceed with that. But if we do an epidural steroid injection and you come back and it only helped you for three weeks, four weeks, and we definitely can't perform these shots every month, so we would begin discussing mild procedure or other potential treatment options. Thank you. Can you do the mild procedure after having a lumbar fusion? We can do it above the level of the fusion, in certain cases below the level of the fusion. We would have to take a good look at your anatomy because once you've had a spinal fusion, uh, the deterioration of the spine above and below the fusion can accelerate. And so we have to make sure we can get our tools in uh, to perform the mild. So it would be on a case by case basis, but yes, we've done them before. Thank you. Is mild an office procedure or is it done in a hospital? It's done it over here. We do it at our outpatient surgery center, but generally it's a hospital based procedure, not something we do in the office suite at this time. Thank you. Does the mild procedure help sciatica pain down the leg? It can help sciatica pain. So sciatica is a term I hear commonly. Uh, it can mean a lot of different things. Uh, but generally, if your sciatic pain is from the spinal stenosis, uh, then it can be of benefit. Thank you. Someone says that they're being evaluated for spinal stenosis since their physical therapist thinks they may have it. If they do have it, are there non-surgical options? Well, we would discuss physical therapy. We would continue uh, discussing weight loss if it's part of it. Uh, but otherwise, it would be medication management to control the symptoms uh, and just body mechanics training, which would be reinforced at physical therapy. Thank you. Would wearing braces uh, on your back help to delay the need for the mild procedure? Uh, the Wearing of braces, uh, generally we prefer patients not do that. Uh, I see wearing a constant brace around your core muscles equivalent to putting someone in a wheelchair. It can lead to atrophy of those core muscles just as keeping someone in a wheelchair could lead to atrophy of the legs. We encounter problems with people who wear braces for too long is their inability to wean off of the brace and we end up having to send them to physical therapy to get them off of the brace. So I only recommend braces for patients during activities that they know will cause back pain. So if you need to help a friend move or push a refrigerator, wear the brace for that. But to wear braces around the clock has shown no benefit in progression of spinal stenosis. Thank you. Do you see any value in incorporating the use of an inversion board into an exercise routine for someone with stenosis and lumbar area herniated discs? So really it depends on the cause of your stenosis. Uh, stenosis can have a multifactorial cause. 
So there was the thickened ligament, the disc bulge, uh, those arthritic joints. Uh, inversion tables do can help decompress the spine. Uh, so if you do have disc herniations or disc bulges causing compression, that inversion table can be of benefit. Uh, but most of the time what I hear, it's generally of a temporary benefit that as soon as you come off uh, that inversion table within an hour or a day or two, the pain returns. Thank you. Does mild help with drop foot? Mild, if it's a permanent drop foot due to permanent damage of that nerve, it's questionable as to how much benefit you get. Now, if we decompress that nerve with mild procedure, uh, there is a potential benefit that it could help. However, nerves could heal very slowly. The goal of the mile really is to get people up standing longer and walking farther because that stenosis worsens in the upright position. It'll compress those nerves that are tight, that cuts off the blood supply to the nerves, and that's when people start experiencing low back, hip pain, and leg weakness. The bending forward kind of opens up that space, and that's why people notice some benefit against leaning against that shopping cart or sleeping in a recliner. Uh, so the drop foot question, it would be something that we would really have to look at the underlying cause and, and have a more detailed discussion about. Thank you. When does mild not work and why does it not work? Mild may not work if the majority of the narrowing is due to a disc herniation or if it's due to those arthritic joints. So you can have narrowing not only in the center, but you can have narrowing on the sides where those little nerves come out. Uh, my tool can't get in to change that disc bulge or the herniation and it can't get around to the side to scrape off that arthritic joint that's compressing the nerve on the side. So once again, that's why we kind of need the MRI and we sit down and we go through that MRI and look at all the ca causes of your narrowing and then discuss mild as a potential treatment. Thank you. Can mild help with urinary incontinence? Uh, mild depending on what the cause is but if you're having urinary incontinence due to a spinal issue uh, generally we consider that a medical emergency so we would get an mri right away and evaluate you possibly for more decompressive surgery however most urinary incontinence is not from the spine and mostly just from age thank you does Spinal stenosis cause pain in shins or pain in swelling in knees? It shouldn't cause pain or swelling in the legs. I mean, it can cause pain in the knees as those nerves get compressed, but that pain should get better when you sit down or lean forward. Is spinal stenosis pain worse later in the day or at night? We hear that sometimes, you know, everyone's symptoms can be different. Not everyone is gonna follow the textbook, but generally the symptoms for spinal stenosis we look for is does the pain worsen with standing and walking? And does it improve with sitting or leaning forward? Thank you. Will the mild procedure work if there's only a five, if the only five millimeter space um, is in the L4, L5 area? Yeah, we do the mild procedure from L1 down to S1, any of those spaces in between, which would include the L4-5. Do you have specific physical therapy recommendations for people to do before they're ready to start having injections or the mild procedure? Uh, generally for low back pain, there's a wealth of information online, but we like people to focus on core strengthening exercises of your low back muscles, abdominal muscles, as well as strengthening of your gluteal muscles, your hamstrings and your legs is what we focus on. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Tracy. We are out of time. If we did not have a chance to get to your comment during the live, we will answer it in the comment section later. Dr. Tracy, would you like to close? No, oh, well, thanks everyone. Uh, if you do have low back pain, and even if your symptoms aren't consistent with spinal stenosis, uh, there's a lot of new treatment options available to treat all those causes we discussed. Uh, so definitely uh, come see us here at Ortho Virginia or any other spine doctor, and we'll sit down and discuss your symptoms and discuss whatever treatment options we have available for you. Thanks everyone.